between animal welfare and animal control uh, as they come about in our city. Animal welfare is what the Humane Society and other agencies like WAG, PFO, A, and State of Safe offer its citizens. The humane treatment of all animals and the desire to place as many animals as possible in forever homes is our mission. On the other hand, Animal control is the duty, not an option, passed down by the state to local municipalities for the public safety of its citizens. It can be found in your own municipal code under Title VII. As a provider of animal welfare, the Humane Society is a local, private, nonprofit, not affiliated with any national group, nor subsidized by any governmental agency. It is funded totally by donations, and the even our much-needed new shelter is being built by over $1 million in restricted donations from private donors. Not one dime of taxpayers' money is being used in that effort. Um, I would say that this speaks volumes for the high priority your constituents pay Play, excuse me, uh, pay to animal welfare and animal control, no matter what the city's internal survey may have said. On the other hand, animal control is handled by law enforcement and is funded by tax dollars. The centerpiece of any animal control program is a place to shelter needy and dangerous animals. And this is where animal welfare and animal control come together in our city. Since Holland County, Squim, and Port Angeles do not have their own shelters, each one has negotiated a separate fee-for-service contract with the Humane Society to provide uh, and fulfill the state mandate. In 2014, the Humane Society took in 1,612 animals. 652 of them, or 40%, came from the city of Port Angeles. And each came with an average cost that we uh, had to take care of $135 per animal. Here's the problem we are here to address tonight. While the county and SWIM are honoring their contracts, apparently the city of Port Angeles does not want to honor their three-year contract they have with the Humane Society. Instead, earlier this week, we received a letter from the city manager stating that a new plan would come into effect in 2016, which would decrease payment over a four-year period down to zero. Even as it stands today, the contract we have does not cover the full cost of the care we provide. We are actually subsidizing the city's animal control program. We are animal lovers, yes, but we are also business people. 
and the numbers being offered by the city won't work for us. It's our job and mission to care for the animals that come to us, and we do this above and beyond the minimum because it's the right thing to do. It's not our job to subsidize the city's mandated animal control program. Honoring the contract is the right thing, both morally and legally, for the city to do. Otherwise, where do you plan to shelter the hundreds of dangerous or needy animals that will be in our city? Does the city have another plan for animal control mandated by the state? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, let's hear Good evening. My name is Candace Pierce, and I'm president of the Olympic Peninsula Humane Society. I'm here this evening representing our board of directors and also the animals that live within the city of Port Angeles. The Humane Society has enjoyed a wonderful partnership with the city for many years. And we would like to continue that relationship that we've enjoyed with you. We exist under a written, mutually agreed upon fee-for-service contract. And that contract expires in 2017. This contract took approximately five months of ongoing negotiations between our board of directors and the city. It was signed in good faith by the Humane Society because there were increases built in for each of the three years. So we knew that eventually we would catch up and be reimbursed for our hard out-of-pocket costs for animal welfare and the sheltering. As a business, we knew we could not continue to sustain at a loss and subsidize the city. We figured one year would be all we could do. It's our impression now that the council feels the money we receive under our mutually agreed upon and signed contract is a gift. And I think, honestly, that you forget that we are operating under a written contract that was negotiated in good faith. We provide an invaluable service to your city residents. We recently received a letter from the city manager stating that council would immediately begin to reduce our payments effective the 1st of 2016. That action could, if followed through, constitute a breach of contract on your part. Should the city actually go ahead and reduce the payment remuneration to us without a mutually agreed upon modification to our existing contract? We believe that the city now has two choices. One, you can honor our existing contract running through 2017, or the city will have to build an animal shelter to house your own city residents' animals that are surrendered. We think that the city's getting a great deal for the services that we provide under state law. This is a mandate by the state, not a choice. It's also included under your own city ordinance. Both Clallam, and, both Clallam County and the City of Swim don't seem to have a, a problem honoring their contracts. We do have a business plan, should we lose your contract. Sadly, it is not going to be a good plan, and one we hope that we do not have to take. However, if the City does choose not to honor this contract, we won't be able to continue to accept any animals from the City residents. That will impact every resident within your city in some fashion, whether or not they have animals. Strays, litters, cruelty, dangerous dogs, abandonment, that's what we handle. Does the city have a plan for this eventuality? This is not a choice the Humane Society wanted to undertake. However, we would like to continue our relationship with you. We look forward to you for the next step. Thank you so much. Senator Miller, we have a number of people signed up to come tonight, so I'm going to start with any speakers for three minutes. Good evening, I'm Sandra Miller, 1901 Hamilton Way, city resident here. Speaking on behalf of the Humane Society and the funding, and they're saying pretty much uh, what needs to be said, and I'm standing here in support of them. 
and the Humane Society. Last time I sent a letter to the mayor and all you council members. I appreciate you spending the time to read that. It's very lengthy, and I won't have the time to spend on it tonight. But I will just <coughs> ask some questions that you might want to consider, or maybe you've, you've thought about. And that is, did you really get legal advice to breach a contract? Is that what they're what your counsel is? And have you considered the risk management part of this if you have lawsuits against you for dangerous dogs or situations that happen in the city when you don't have a place for the animals to go? Would it be cheaper and less expensive to contract with the Humane Society or would it be less expensive to take your, the animals that come in here to a veterinary service? And I think we know the answer to that one. I think it would be more costly in the long run not to honor your contract and provide payment for their services. And it's a pretty short-sighted decision. Is it really a, an evidence of strengthening the community safety and welfare? Animal control is a mandated code with the city, but we don't have an animal control officer that's not even being provided. This issue will be a, a problem if you fail to take care of the animals by contracting for services and all the animals are dropped off at the city. So my question is, which city department do you want us to take the next litter of kittens and box of puppies and dangerous dog? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Council Ward. So I'm just going to read this because I'm not a talker. So. Name and address. I want to share. your name and address. Oh, I'm 364 Blue Ridge Road, Chelsea Ward. Thank you. I want to share with you some information I obtained from CrimeReports.com, which I found on the Sheriff's Department site. All of the following crimes were reported between November 2nd to November 12th, which is only a 10-day time period. There have been eight reports of assault, five thefts, eight thefts from vehicle, over 15 other sexual offenses, five breaking and entry, and one assault with a deadly weapon. This is just the crime that is actually being reported. Some people don't report anymore because they feel like there's no point because of lack because of lack of follow-up since our law enforcement is so overwhelmed and underfunded. Port Angeles has gotten progressively worse in just the last few years. Myself and a large group of other people in this community have been spending hours researching this overwhelming problem as well as driving around and witnessing it all in all in first hand. Examples of the problem. Number one, I watched two car loads of people unloading their belongings into the woods down at Rainier parking lot by the waterfront trail. There's a hole cut in the fence on the east side of the lot. Number two, there is a daily drug dealing, vehicle scoping, hand handling happening in and around the Safeway parking lot by the courthouse, sometimes three to four vehicles at a time working together. This happens at night and in broad daylight. I called it in once and the police police had to answer an important call and couldn't get to it in time. I would encourage you to sit in your car at Safeway for an extended amount of time and watch for yourself what happens there. Number three, people were building a tent structure out of plastic, their belongings, and garbage the other day on the side of the highway coming into town. They were aggressively panhandling and blocking the sidewalks. Number four, drug deals are being witnessed often at the city fountain downtown by business owners and workers. Number five, one well-known couple around here who was recently busted by OpNet for delivery of meth and weapons charge has been driving through neighborhoods at night with their headlights off. We watched the female looking into vehicles. Um, we called the police. Three of them arrived relatively quickly, but we were, were unable to charge her with a crime because she told them she was out of gas and on her way to get more. They knew she wasn't truthful, but weren't able to do much. Not sure why these people are still prowling our neighborhoods since they were arrested eight months ago. Eight months ago. You're going to need to sum up your remarks, please. Number six, individuals are living in their campers, vehicles, tents, in family parks, city streets, 
lookouts, the spit, and now the rest stop coming into this town. One man was living in his broken down BMW at Crown Park for three days and was a huge stress to the elderly people in the neighborhood and parents with kids who are too afraid to take their kids to the park. He is relocated and living somewhere else. Individuals driving impaired. One of my friends almost got ran into by one of the same people we were already talking about on here. Children in family parks are being vandalized with trash needles, sometimes even human feces. I feel that we have some very valid concerns about our safety in this town. I'm happy to see that you have hired four new police officers and are getting help with prosecuting felonies and drug crimes. Please do not stop addressing these issues. Please put more action behind your words. I really do think we can turn this around. Um, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> According to the PDN, we spent $17 million to reconstruct a waterfront property to make our city beautiful. But what about our homeless, drug addicted criminals? They have so many resources available Serenity House, Evergreen Family Village, Housing Authority, etc. These people are not concerned with their safety, they're not concerned with using our resources to better themselves. They're more concerned about where they're going to get their next high. And they're going to find any way to do that. If somebody wants a new, a new TV, go talk to a heroin addict. They'll walk right into Walmart, walk out with a brand new TV. You'll pay pennies on the dollar and have a new TV and they'll have their next time. So then we want to know what's being done about it. We have hired some new police officers, so hopefully it'll get better. However, a lot of times the police officers are letting them go. The courts are letting them go to come back on their own recognizance. Um, the other day I was on the jail roster, and there was one person there that, was, that had been arrested and was released the following Monday. They were a three-time failure to appear. Why would you let me go again? There's something wrong with that. They're out there vandalizing our parks and dropping their needles. Um, the other day, one of the one of the areas was cleaned up. I do believe it was down front in Lincoln, and they picked up needles and they found meth, um, human feces, trash in our parks. Why do our children have to witness that? Why do they even have to know that drugs and criminals exist? I had someone tell me the other, way, the other day that it was my son's own fault that his bike was stolen. He should have left it outside. It's not his fault. No one should be able to walk into your dog and take your things, ever. With that being said, I think that we need to at least be able to match the money that we're spending <coughs> to make our city beautiful on law enforcement and other programs to solve this problem. You're going to need to set up your reverse first. You can slap with some makeup and make a pretty face. But if you don't fix the core, it's still going to be ugly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Tom Back. And I'd like to say the last two speakers that I would encourage you to uh, call with the chief of police and discuss your concerns with him because council is very concerned about the issues that you're British and <coughs> My name is Tom Backy, and I live in 48 Lotus Lane, and I'm a volunteer with the Humane Society, and I'm on the board. Um, the way the weather has been the last few days, it would be tough to be a lost dog or an abandoned litter of kittens. It's a good thing to have a humane society in the Olympic Peninsula. Um, I know that uh, the board is discussing, the council is discussing cuts to nonprofits and things, but I think that it's not accurate to lump the humane society and the services we provide just in because we happen to be a nonprofit, just to lump it in there and cut, make cuts to that. Um, we provide an important service to city residents, and in turn, the city pays the Humane Society a fee for these services. If the Humane Society was not able to provide the services, I wonder how the city would provide animal control to its residents. So uh, I, just, I just ask that the city council continue the good working relationship that uh, the city council has had with the Humane Society over the last many years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Tracy McCallum, I live at 1115 D Street. I have volunteered some at the shelter, not a lot, but I know that a good deal of the animals that come in there are animals that have been uh, that are litters of kittens and puppies that have been just left on the streets somewhere. Um, I'm afraid that if, if the contract is not honored, that that's going to continue and be even worse. Um, and um, what's going to happen to these dogs is if, if they survive, they'll grow up to be wild, feral animals living in the city. And they won't have rabies shots. And all we need is for one child to be bitten by a wild, rabid dog. And we've got huge lawsuits. Um, it seems to me that funding the shelter would be a lot cheaper than uh, uh, as a preventive measure than having to treat it symptomatically when it gets really, really bad. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Betty Anderson? Hi, Betty Anderson, 118 Motor Avenue. I'm here to speak about the Olympic uh, Peninsula Humane Society, too. Um, where I was born and raised in Port Angeles, I grew up between what was called Poor Bills and the Dog Pound. Only there was no name for the road that I grew up on and stuff. Um, I'd like to speak about, I know about dumping the animals because I've come home to find many a dog or cat that had been dumped at the Humane Society that wandered down and came onto our property looking for food. And most of them were in very bad shape. Occasionally. Um, they'd be frozen kittens because of the snow. People just dump pets. They just do. This is one of the best Olympic Peninsula Humane Societies that I've ever had to deal with or work with. I also help raise dog and cat food to, to help out with the community. Um, again, I just want to get a couple quotes really fast. Uh, one is by St. Francis. Um, Not to hurt our humble brethren, the animal, is our first duty to them. But to stop there is not enough. We have a higher mission to be of service to them whenever they require it. If you have men or women who will exclude any of God's creatures from the shelter of compassion and pity, you will have men and women who will deal likewise with their fellow man. Mahat Gandhi also said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Uh, you guys, I really hope that you reconsider or at least try to work with it because again this is one of the best humane society they have gone out of the way the stay and save um low budget you know i mean they work so hard to bring in these for 10 to 20 bucks you've got a cat that can be a fix you've got a dog that can be fixed and that stops a lot of this we're not seeing the huge amounts that happen but they still happen and without any funding um like i say i just hate to see it happen again with the, the pet and dog population. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Betty Joe Anderson? That was me. Yeah, Lanny Bush is here. Is that right? Good evening. My name is Lonnie Butcher Smith. I live at 364 Garling Road, and I'm a county resident. But I'm here tonight because I got the email about the possibility of your cutting the funding to the Humane Society. And I feel that, that we're kind of a, a three-pronged effort here. The city of Squim, the city of Port Angeles, and the county. And that if money is cut at any one of those three points, there's going to be a domino effect and a fallout for the rest of us. I learned a lot here just sitting tonight listening to the other speakers. I didn't realize that it was a mandate from the state that we take care of animals that are strays and, and abandoned. I think that to forget them or turn our backs on them is an unconscionable act. And I encourage you strongly to reconsider your plan. Thank you. 
Thank you. Shelby Taylor. Shelby Taylor. Excuse me. I'm Shelby Taylor. I live at 183 Windflower in Port Angeles. Um, I too got the um, the notification about uh, you pulling the plug on the on the uh, funding for this. I was kind of struck by the fact that you have a legal contract that was negotiated and that you promised to fulfill, and now within weeks of a new year that you're pulling the plug on it and, and making people scurry for taking care of, of animals. I'm, I'm thinking of those commercials that I see, and I, I have to close my eyes where you see starving dogs and starving cats, and they're in the street. Uh, that's heartbreaking enough, uh, but I think about the example you're setting by not honoring that contract, uh, by not doing what is mandated of you uh, by the city, and also the, what, where are these animals going to go? What, what are you going to do with them if, if the uh, Humane Society isn't going to be able to take them because they can't afford it? Are you going to make some kind of arrangements to euthanize them? And who's going to do that? And where are you going to pay for it? Uh, there was a kitten I, re I read in the paper recently that was diagnosed with rabies. So this is now starting, and it could spread, and especially if we're not taking care of the, of the uh, animals that are, are wandering and uh, abandoned. So I feel that this is, this is a, moral, a moral obligation that you have to fulfill uh, obviously, the community has stepped forward with their donations to create this new uh, building for the Humane Society. And here you have this facility. I don't know where you're going to get the money to build a facility in order to take care of this, because the problem isn't going to go away. So I hope that you reconsider uh, and, and realize that this is a moral obligation. And like one of the women said here, that uh, you, you see what a society is like about how they take care of their animals. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have pets or you have children who have pets and love them and to, to think that you would let them be um, just abandoned and not cared for and not at least put out of their misery um, by, by our taxes. And then if, if someone is hurt or uh, bitten, the taxpayers are going to end up paying for that anyway. So it seems to me it's, it's better insurance to still provide for what you have said that you were going to provide. And, and help these animals and, and help the volunteers and the people that have put their life and their soul into maintaining uh, uh, organizations like the Humane Society. Thank you. Thank you. John Proctor. My name is John Proctor. I am a resident of Port Angeles. I live on West 4th Street, 2123. I'm a retired veterinarian. I am not associated with the uh, Olympic Peninsula Humane Society, however, I feel very strongly about what's going on here. My wife and I moved here five years ago, and I found out right away that basically there is no animal control in Port Angeles. The police are supposedly in, uh, in charge of animal control, but, I, but after talking to civil police officers, it's basically in name only. Uh, they don't really do much in the way of animal control. You folks here have a gift. These generous people have throughout their time, their skills, their money, and, and they're doing a marvelous job out here on the Navy Main Shelter. Um, I hope you appreciate really what they're doing. If you've been down to the old shelter, it's really sad. Uh, my wife and I donate food out there for the dogs and cats. And I told her one day, I said, don't you dare go back to that kennel back there and look and see what those dogs have to live in. And she did. She came home and she's crying. I said, I can't believe it. I would ask you to do the right thing and continue to support this uh, endeavor. This, we really need it. We just can't walk away from it. Uh, those of you, uh, I'm sure probably some of you have your own business or own your own business. I own mine for 35 years. Uh, I can see a gift coming a mile away, and you guys have a real gift 
with this humane shelter. Please continue to uh, lend it, help lend it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sharon Gray. Good evening, my name is Sharon. Uh, I live at 122 Pierce Road. My primary concern I'd like to address is panhandling. There used to be only a few regular individuals who actively panhandled in Port Angeles. Now we have close to a dozen recognizable individuals who are becoming increasingly aggressive with their tactics. Last week I was leaving Port Angeles Plaza in my personal vehicle after visiting a few stores in the vicinity. I noticed a few individuals on the sidewalk near the stop sign at the middle of the plaza. They have a large pile of their personal belongings covered with various blankets on the sidewalk. I witnessed the male individual knocking on the windows of the SUV in front of me and then speaking and gesturing wildly once they opened their windows. The SUV did not give the individual money and sped off as soon as they saw the first gap in traffic. This individual anticipated my pulling forward and began towards my vehicle running erratically. As I had my then six and a half week old son in the back seat of my car, I, I panicked. I did not want contact or pressure from a stranger acting in such a manner. I put my vehicle in reverse and sped away faster than I should have, disturbed and annoyed by the situation. These same individuals went on to approach and bother many people in the following days, as well as build an impressive and unattractive pile of things on the sidewalk. They continued their presence and moderately aggressive money-seeking behavior despite multiple contacts with law enforcement. No one wants to deal with such situations while going about their day. I feel that panhandling needs to be addressed. It's becoming increasingly disturbing and at times frightening for members of, of our community. Many of these individuals are becoming increasingly desperate and aren't afraid to pressure and intimidate. The litter and mess left behind, which is a byproduct of panhandling, is, is unattractive and it's contributing to another problem. The issue of drug paraphernalia and other dangerous waste in common areas throughout the community. It's no secret that Port Angeles parks, those intended for use by children and families, are hot spots for needles, glass pipes, pieces of tin foil with, with substance residual and human excrement. In recent days, individuals and grassroots organized groups have taken on the task of removing these items and making volunteer cleanup efforts for the greater good of the community. This is incredibly helpful and their findings are downright scary. We're at a time in our community where a child coming across a dirty needle while innocently playing at a park on Saturday afternoon is a very real thing. Even parks where community members bring their dogs to play have become littered with the same items and piles of human waste. I personally no longer take my dogs on such outings after witnessing my black lab almost stepping on a needle while playing ball at Lincoln Park. People who do continue to take their pets and families to these areas must perform a needle sweep before allowing anyone to play. It's an absolute necessity. This is such an amazing town. It's truly sad to see these things happening. Open drug use and dealings at the town fountain, needles at the parks, aggressive panhandlers on corners and in parking lots, daily problems and thefts fueling the local illegal drug industry. I could stand before the council and continue on of everything I've seen for hours. I would like to thank you guys for funding the four additional police officers for the Port Angeles Police Department and for giving me the opportunity to voice my concern as a community member. With any luck, the help of the council and the community and continue to increase awareness and lack of tolerance, these problems will eventually <laughs> improve. Please continue to make our concerns a priority and let us work together to take back our town. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. The first two speakers regard the drug crime. I would encourage you to contact Chief Gallagher and talk about your concerns. Thank you. Let's see Miles. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, my name is Sue Miles. I live at 454 Stripe at Peak Road. I've been active in animal welfare in this community for over 17 years. Um, I started out walking dogs with the Humane Society and uh, over the years I have been on its board of directors and have served as its president of the board. I am president of Spay to Save, Mobile Spay Neuter Clinic, um, serving in Collin County. And I 
have been on the Animal Issues Advisory Committee, um, served as chair for several years. Um, I have, uh, so I'm familiar with this process, I'm, I'm familiar with, with your um, outlook on these contracts. I've negotiated these contracts. I've, I've spoken with, with some of you before. Um, I think the important thing is, and you know, we've come to this crossroads several times over the years where somebody has to tighten their belt and it's always the animal services that tend to go first. And I, th I think we have to refocus. And what have I, I have always maintained that it's not just a service for animals. We're really helping people. It's a service for the people of Fort Angeles. Uh, there are approximately 70% um, of households in Fort Angeles that have dogs and cats. Um, there are over 10,000 pet dogs and cats in the city and probably a few thousand stray and feral cats in the community, um, many of whom are actually cared for for very caring uh, residents. I think what we should focus on is how this is going to um, affect the people. And even if you don't think about you know, the animals out there that, that may not be cared for. But I think what's gonna happen is when people go to the Humane Society to get help, and it happens all the time, and they're giving numbers of you know, over 650 people who have gone to the Humane Society for help. And I assume that also includes the police officers who are taking their animals that they pick up off the street. It's a very necessary service for them, um, as well as the residents. And I think um, if someone goes to the Humane Society in a dire strait, you know, someone's died and they can no longer keep their pet, or they've found an abandoned animal or an injured animal, um, there are so many reasons why people relinquish their pets. I mean, they no longer care for them, they can't afford to. I think when people start going to the Humane Society and they say, I'm sorry, we can't serve you. We don't have the funding to do that and the city is not providing that. I'm very sorry. Um, and, and, and then it's gonna come on your doorstep. I mean, I would be standing out there handing out your phone numbers if I were that. I mean, because somebody's gonna to have to deal with the people. And I think it's gonna be a very unhappy situation. So I hope people reconsider. I hope people try to somehow move the, the high so that we uh, can continue to help with that. that thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Services. 
Jackie Corby, who deals with victims of abuse, rape, stuff like this, getting crimes. I hear the city want to, in breach of contract, with the Humane Society, take care of unwanted pets, abandoned animals. I'm not a lawyer, I can't speak to legal issues, even though I tried to mention one of fluoride, but I can We need to take care of our poor and our needy. We need to take care of the victims of crime. And there is a crime wave going on in the city. We need to empower the police to actually go after some of those people and stop them right back out on the street or not even arrest them. We need to take care of the people in the city. Stop poisoning them with fluoride. Get the crime off the street. Take care of the victims, whether they're old children being abused or animals. Take the moral high ground. Leave the city. The city uh, managers and those, they're yes, hardworking people, like very briefly. Hardworking people, but they also look to the city council for guidance. Take the moral high ground. Do the right thing, please. Thank you. And Dr. Calvin, Yeah? Uh, request deferral, please, for your later period. Sorry? Uh, I speak in your, at your later public hearing. Second public Second comment. Like wait. Sure, yeah. Okay. okay. That's all we've signed up to speak to public comment. So we'll close the public comment and move to the public hearing that's scheduled for 6.30. First is the ordinance letter and property tax request in 2016. Mayor, members of the council, this is the second public hearing on limiting of the property tax for collection in 2016. We will collect an estimated amount of 4,400,000 from the property tax. The council has already authorized the 1% increase at the previous meeting. So tonight, there's no additional presentation. What we're asking is that you open the public hearing, then close the public hearing, and then consider the ordinance for its second and final meeting. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions, Chad? If not, we'll open the public hearing. If anybody wishes to speak to the issue, please come to the microphone, give your name and address. In the debate, we'll have a walk out street. I did sign up to speak on this issue. I've not heard the city council or the city what what all we're going to do about the property taxes. I did get my appraisal from the county. Excuse me, Let's wait to the crowd so that we can oh. give you our full attention. If you're planning on the please do so now. Services. 
strong police force, particularly crime, I know there's a lot to consider there. Appreciate that, Rose, once again. Thank you. Anyone else to speak this evening? Anyone else who wishes to speak?
three level priorities have been taken care of. And then finally, the highest priorities are in group one. You may recall this from earlier this year, where we had that in groups, the red group is considered group three or those most meet on the highest area to be cut first. The yellow is group two, the green is group one. In the groupings, you see in the top section where support to external agencies, which include the Humane Society, the PA Forward Committee, the financial contributions to FARO, Health and Human Services, the Fallon County ED, and then down below you see all of the youth and family programs, uh, financial contribution to the Fine Arts Center, which is currently part of the city's program offerings, and then a number of other ones. We have eliminated most, if not all, of those at this point out of the 2016 budget, or for those agencies being supported, put those on a reduction plan to phase out that funding by 2019. Um, again, the four agencies are affected. We have reduced staffing by a total of 4.08 FTEs in a variety of areas. The largest single contributor in that was out of Parks and Recreation, where we eliminated all of the youth and family program. The property tax, as was noted in the previous ordinance, was increased by 1%. And then at the last council meeting, council approved the agreement with Clallam County on criminal justice. Um, citywide revenues increased by 1.1 million. Unfortunately, expenses increased by 1.7 million. Uh, primarily, a lot of the changes are due to capital projects that are starting to be wrapped up or finished, and some that will not be totally complete by year end. So council will then, in early 2016, reappropriate those dollars so we can finish those projects. There's, we refunded the limited tax general obligation bonds, if you recall, a couple of months ago. That produced savings to the general fund, as well as savings to the electric and water utilities, which meant it reduced monies coming into the general fund to pay that debt service. And then we now have the recommendations from the Lodging Task Committee that to be incorporated. So the proposed 2016 budget for the entire city at this point is 109,706,000. The current budget for 15 for the same funds is 146,419,000. So you see that significant reduction. Again, you will, you, you will see, right after the start of the year when we bring the first budget amendment forward, that number will probably go up by eight or ten million dollars because as we bring in those leftover capital projects, CSO phase two and the remaining landfill work, that and some others, that will add up to those numbers. Expenditures are the same, if you see that. Where we are starting to see a shift is in our in the amount that we are paying for capital projects. We are shifting from actually borrowing money or getting new revenues and moving that into now debt service. We are paying back on the bonds for the solid waste landfill, and we are now starting to pay back on all of the loans for the CSO projects and other projects. So you're seeing a shift from actually paying for projects into paying for debt service. In the general fund, going forward, you see an increase of revenue over last year of 143,000 to 19.8 million. Most of that comes in the tax area. A little bit, about 66,000 additional dollars in property tax. The rest comes from a combination of sales tax increase as well as utility tax increases. And I must also note the four thousand and few dollars of marijuana tax that we get from the state. On the expenditure side, Excuse me, I thought the last time you recorded the marijuana tax, I believe we get about eighteen thousand dollars. That that that's a, the year-long contribution. We have 4,000 this year for 
prompt for marijuana tax for the 2015 budget. Oh, okay. but, it, but it's about 18,000. That's the number that's currently there, but I need to advise council that with where the state budget is and the passage of 1366 and other issues, all of that state funding assistance is in potential jeopardy. Okay, I just need a clarification. <coughs> yep. Okay. So you see, here's the expenditures where you see that, that actually salaries and benefits are going down in 16 as opposed to what they were in 15 as a result of the reduction in staff. Uh, final comment, as the city manager noted in our last workshop, that this is another step forward, but they still have a long way to go. The economic challenges will continue for the foreseeable future, um, and there is no solution or relief in sight. We talked about briefly just a minute ago about the potential impact from the state legislature. I'm very concerned over what will happen in that regard. And then finally, the ability to pay issue, which council has reminded staff of on an ongoing basis, is always in the forefront of how much residents and businesses can afford to pay is a paramount concern as we look at setting of utility rates and taxes and fees. So tonight, we're asking that you open the public hearing, then continue the public hearing to December 1st, conduct the first meeting tonight, and then continue that to the December 1st meeting for potential second meeting and final adoption. And with that, I'll be glad to answer questions. Any questions about it? Um, no, but I guess I'd like to get a, a talk to the folks out here because this priority setting that I went through was probably one of the hardest things we all went through. And we did not want to cut a lot of things that you see on that list, especially the human health services, um, you know, things to the um, human society. But we had some major expenses. And the other thing that we didn't get is we didn't get a lot of tax money from the Ponds closure of one of their main engines. And that took a real huge hit. So that's one reason we had to make some really difficult decisions. Um, so, like I said, I just wanted that um, so, so that they understand that it's not what I mean, we would love to put all the stuff back to where we could. So, but um, one other thing I did have a question as to is one of the reasons why the Human Society was um, low on our priority was because we didn't believe we had a legal obligation. One of, the, one of the rating criteria was a legal obligation. And I guess I need some clarification on that. Because um, I said in the rating criteria was what was the legal obligation for us to do that, and therefore that's where it's going to too low. I'll refer that to the city attorney, because so that's outside my expertise. There is no legal obligation in the, in the same sense that we have been using that in the, um, the priority setting. In the priority setting, we were talking about legal obligations. And for instance, in the state statute, there is a mandate to the city that we must provide for criminal prosecution. So that is a clear mandate stated in the state statute that we must do that. There is no equivalent requirement for uh, animal control or specific or building a shelter or anything else. Okay. So, no. so um, I guess uh, one of the things I think that we might need to discuss is, so if an animal does get brought in and the Human Society does not accept animals from Port Angeles um, because of the contract, what do we do? What are, what are obligations to do? I would, um, I think I would like to defer that if I may, and I will research that question, and I will um, uh, send a uh, memo to the city council. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, thank you, because like I said, it was just one of the, I, I appreciate the comments that were brought up um, <clears throat> specifically about this, um, so that, and also I guess if you could research the issue with the contract, the legality of breaking the contract. Oh. Was, we're not breaking the contract. The contract contains a provision that says that uh, if, the, if the council does not appropriate the full amount of funding, that the, uh, there are two choices. One, the contract can be terminated, or they can uh, allocate a lower amount of funding. So there's no issue with the contract. Okay, so there's no issues with the contract. No, but... uh, not in that sense. And, and
and again, I understand that there is no legal mandate that we build a shelter or, or do anything specific like that. Uh, as I understand, what you're asking is, as a practical matter, if, if the main society stops doing that, then, then what happens? Right. Okay. And, that, and that's the question that I would like to try to answer. So you'll have that for the December first meeting. I'm sorry. You'll have that information for the December first meeting. For the next. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, Chris? Are we public hearing? Byron or or Mr. Bloor, could you give us an overview of the contracts that we're actually looking at reducing? This is all part of a conversation of next year's budget. Uh, and for example, in our PowerPoint, we have 2016 budget highlights. We've got United Way Fine Arts Center, Fierro Marine Life Center, and the, as well as the Humane Society listed. Are we going back on something that we've agreed to with all four of these groups? So Mr. Mayor and Council, we might, might want to take a team approach to that response, being that we have different staff members that administer each of those contracts. And so I'm going to defer um, first to uh, Corey Delacott, who administers, uh, I believe, uh, a couple of those contracts, and he can speak to those, and uh, and then we can uh, cover the rest as we move forward. Mayor and Council, as far as the Fine Arts Center goes, um, in the 85 agreements with the Fine Arts Center, there's no obligation that the city ever funds the operations of the Fine Arts Center. Uh, the second one is the Fierro Marine Life Center was a, it's a true payment yearly um, contract that we do, which we're obligating uh, fully, the full amount this year and then taking the four-year approach of the reductions for that. So that is more of a um, facility use agreement, um, more so than anything else. Hey, Corey, you've had this conversation with the staff of Fierro Marine? Correct. So they're fully aware of They're fully aware, aware as, long, as well as the fire center. I, I actually contacted them before we, I, we even took this to the priority setting. Thank you. And I think you might want to add that the, uh, for the uh, Fine Arts Center, they're going to get some money back from the lodging tax. So the lodging tax, uh, they did ask for additional funds, but it will not cover the full amount that they will be losing from the city. So it will actually be uh, reduced down their overall budget about $2,000. So Fine Arts Center, as well as the Humane Society, is what's proposed taking a hit on the 2016 budget? Well, all four, all four agencies, United Way, Fine Arts Center, Farrell, and the Humane Society, all are proposed to see reductions in 16. Yeah, and I'm, uh, my curiosity, Byron, is to the point of what do we have a, a signed agreement with? And it sounds to me like the only thing I've heard of so far is the Humane Society that we're trying to go back on the signing agreements. There is a signed, Bill, correct me if I misrepresent, there is a signed agreement with the Humane Society for a three year agreement, and we are in year one of that agreement. With the other three, and I'll, I'll give a little disclosure here the Fine Arts Center, my wife is president of the Fine Arts Center Foundation, so I don't deal with anything to do with the Fine Arts Center. But there are no ongoing contractual funding agreements for those three institutions. Those are all discretionary actions by the City Council. The reason I bring this up is I'm fully in support of a signed agreement that the City makes with anyone. When I ran for this position two years ago, the hot topic item at that time was the smart meters. And that contract stunk, but I supported it 100 percent. And it ended up coming out where, where we did succeed uh, getting back a large amount of our money. But again, I'm, I'm, I believe that we as a council signed something in an agreement to move forward with. So uh, I, I just don't see being able to support this budget without the Humane Society receiving the full amount that we've previously agreed to. Um, I concur with Councilmember Widow. When we did our budget set priority setting, it was, I understood it was to be forward looking. 
to give us an opportunity to what direction to proceed. Also, um, there's a distinction between each one. We, with the Humane Society, wasn't really in group three. It was on the cusp. It had 42 points, but um, I've been told that we do have a Port Angeles Municipal Code. So is there any, but you can clarify that, whether we have any code, whether we are responsible for um, an animal authority. I know 10 years ago, we had an animal control officer in the police department. The city council at that time chose to reduce that position to save money in their budget, and then they began partnering with the Humane Society. Last year, we had a lot of negotiations, and council um, really worked hard to come to a three-year agreement with the Humane Society. And I, I'm proud to be a member of this council, and I feel that it's, it's an ethical, um, it's really, it's ethical that we, we live up to our agreements. Now, I, the, the Humane Society agreement is for three years. If moving forward with the priority setting in three years, we should take a look at it, council should take a look at it, and, and with the council priorities at that time, um, really begin a new negotiation. But once we signed an agreement and we went through the budget process last year and we inked an agreement, they took that to the bank because that's our, the way I was raised. When you sign a contract, that's your word, that's your honor, and I want us to honor that agreement. Now, I have gone through some of our, I've gone through the budget, but I do see that we have um, increased, we have some increases, like supplies has increased $55,344. Travel and training has been increased. And so I think I would like to take a closer look at where we can perhaps um, look at our, at our obligations. And I feel very strongly that the people of this community, we're in charge of public safety. We're here to serve the citizens. And animal control and animal control authority lands on our shoulders. We can't just shrug that off. Um, I feel that we should absolutely honor our three-year agreement moving forward, and then at that point, renegotiate. So I really can't support the budget as it stands now, because we must honor our I have found in the discussions that Congress is in that he's particularly compelling and concerning. So, Bill, I'm, I would be very anxious to get your memo before our next meeting or you send it first. So, there are some questions that have been raised that I thought we, I have some concern about it. Whether they are mandated, they aren't. Actually, I share the concern. This evening about uh, contracts that have been uh, put in place and how we handle those. And welcome well, to the Let me repeat that there is no mandate to say law that we uh, have a shelter in particular with regard to uh, animals in the same sense that there is a, a, an express mandate that we, uh, I, the example I used was paid for uh, criminal prosecution. Uh, Sissy asked a related question to that, and I said on that to be, to be positive and to be clear, I'd like to confer that. I'll get to research back to you before the next council meeting. That's why. We very much appreciate that. Okay, uh, it sounds as though that uh, the council may want to consider some options to the uh, uh, reduction of the contract for the uh, um, Indian Society, so I would ask the staff. Take a look at some areas and provide us with some options to take a look at that next. Uh, <clears throat> during the December 1st meeting, should the council decide to do something differently with the Humane Society? Does that the council agree with that? Yes. I just wanted to make a comment Go ahead. On, on the whole topic. Um, I want to thank all the people from the Humane Society coming and speaking on this. I know it's a real issue from the heart and it means a lot, but it means a lot to all of us too. Uh, 
I like to get a couple clarifications because sometimes you want to get overrule what's actually taking place. And one of the things that, from my understanding, talking to the legal department, is that we do, we're not breaking a contract. We have a contract with a very clear clause that the Humane Society agreed upon that said if we don't have the money, we don't have to be held to those original plan terms. Now, we didn't get notice that we were going to lose $600,000 this year from Nippon needing to shut down the cable machine. That caused for some drastic changes. We went through months of priority settings. And I do not think it's fair. I, I'd like to look and see if we can look at an alternative. But I don't think it's fair to do a knee-jerk reaction after all that planning, having a contract in play that's completely legal, and being told that we technically don't have an obligation to start with. We've got a lot of scenarios going here. So let's not try to have a knee-jerk reaction and make some mistakes by reacting too quickly to make us feel good. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Okay, go ahead. I, I'd like to comment to Councilmember Gase's comments that in the past we've done some elective capital projects that came out of the general fund. And this budget is 100% about the general fund. So my proposal to you going forward is let's not do an elective uh, capital project in the year 2016. I think, again, we signed this in good faith. You're right, absolutely, we didn't see this shortfall coming. But the fact of the matter is, our partners that take care of our animals in our community have gone ahead with their business plan. I, I don't understand why we can't live up to what we've previously agreed to. Because, because we have no money. That's the reason. So the real question is, we could wave the magic wand and, and fund the entire project. The real question is, whose budget do we take that out of? All right. And, well, and that's, I think that's a legitimate question. And before making a decision, that's what we have to decide first. Do we take away one of the three right. four police officers? Do we cut some expenses in stationary or somewhere in between? I'd actually, the answer to I'd actually draw your attention to a, a topic that I'm not going to speak on later, but it's gone way over budget. And you know what? how we're going to pay for that? is the accumulated money that's left over from additional capital projects. But that's from a that's different that's fund. That's nothing to do with the general fund. Okay, let's let's move on here. Do you have one more comment on the little plug here? We we have we have increased travel and training, we have increased supplies, and we have re increased our reserves over our goal. So I just want to take a closer look at the budget for further discussion since we have signed a three year contract with our partners. Now, we do not have a state mandate to have a fire department. We don't. Should we have a fire department? Should we fund it? Yes. This is part of public safety. This is part of the health and welfare of our community, and we have signed it. I just want us to live up to our agreement, or at least look at the possibility of how we could. I'd like to just look at the options. Okay, we're going to start with staff to bring some options next meeting. Okay, we'll open up the public hearing, everybody. Um, I'd like to make a comment. Go ahead. Something. Go ahead, Brad. Um, I think the issue here is how do we deal with animal control? Not animal welfare, but how do we deal with animal control? And I think we need to uh, get that information from our attorney floor, and um, I don't think we need to
taking the moral high ground. When you sign a contract, even if you get somewhere to find for it, that you weasel the way out of it because you want to put some extra in savings. If I buy a car that way, I think they go to jail or try to sell one or something. I don't know. If you sign a contract, that's your word. You're representing the people here. And yes, it is a safety issue. And if you've got money, you can increase reserves and go buy some more office supplies. I think that's a no brainer. It's not your contract. You're representing all of us, all of our words. I'll try to thank you. Okay, give me the same name address. Sandra Miller, 1901 Hamilton Way. Just to hear some of the comments um, on the budgeting, if there's another way to find the funding. I saw parking enforcement as a higher priority than animal services. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something you can look at. Um, I know it's coming out of the police department budget, but is there any other way you could make it, say, you know, you have a lodging tax, so animal lodging. I mean, you've got the same concept here. Where's the priority? Um, you know, you had no contracts with some of those other agencies or agreements with them, but you gave them money. But you made a contract agreement with the Humane Society, but now you don't want to give them money. That, that's a dual message to me. And I looked through the budget a couple days ago and I saw something on there about Lincoln Theater for $68,000 and I don't know what that's about. Um, but I don't know if that's some money that could be reallocated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Eloise, can we get a microphone to Eloise please? I would like to talk to you in your open public uh, comment period, which will have. Always need your name address, please. Oh, Eloise Hale and protect the peninsula's future. There's one real obvious thing that you might consider: is the expenses that you are putting into the fluoride material can be used for much better purposes. And I hope to tell you a little bit more about why that's a wise idea in your next public comment period. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else wish to speak? Very final time. Anyone else wish to speak? Uh, we'll continue to public hearing with Senator first. Let me read the ordinance. The ordinance of the City of Port Angeles, Washington, adopting the 2016 budget for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2016. Thank you all. So, Mr. Mayor, it would be very helpful to staff to get firm consensus from council that you would like us to with finding alternative options uh, to be cut rather than cutting the funding from that contract. It's extremely important that we have clear direction from council on this issue. And so if, if we do in fact have four members of council that would like us to bring back options at the next meeting, we would like to know that that will help us uh, be effective in ensuring that you all can consider uh, the budget as the second and final reading on the de December 1st meeting. All right suggested that option that earlier I saw a lot of heads bobbing, so I'm assuming that there's at least four members of the council that want to see those options. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's get back to the regular agenda then. Uh, they can, is, uh, Catherine, are you here for the uh, OMC project? I am. So why don't we go ahead and take care of that then. Let's, let's move to the OMC project. The uh, amendment to the Georgiana Street Sewer Stormwater Improvement Project, WW1415 and PR0315. Change order number two. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask uh, from the 34, what do you advise? I'm not going to participate in this. My wife works for uh, Olympic Medical Center. <laughs> should, can I, should I step out? Can I just sit here? And... Oh. The practice of the council has adopted in the past is for you to set out if you're not going to say, all right, and then have somebody bring it back in. Great, thanks. Can you excuse that? Okay. Captain, okay. you Okay. If I could just give um, a quick comment. Um, for you, I, I uh, placed in, on your guys there a uh, supplemental uh, sheet outlining a little clearly in table form. The, um, the uh, contract award, OMG contributions, uh, change orders, and the listing of the uh, uh, project savings from the various utilities and the dollar amount. So it's a little more clear 
sure uh, where the money's coming from, where it's going. Um, and the very bottom is the total that will come out of reserves for uh, Catherine's going to give a quick presentation on the trench failures we, we faced uh, during the construction of this project. And then we'll go back in discussions. Okay. So, um, the Georgia Edison Reserve Sewer and Stormwater Improvements is a project that's designed to upgrade stormwater mains and sewer mains in the vicinity of Georgiana and Ray Streets. And this project came up very quickly this year in response to Olympic Medical Center's desire to build an office tower, and we needed to make some improvements to the city's infrastructure. Olympic Medical Center has contributed to those improvements, a total of um, Three hundred and forty two thousand five hundred, I think. Um, yes, three hundred and forty two thousand five hundred. And so we led a contract to work and work construction. They were the low bidder in July, uh, and they proceeded to begin construction. There was a change order right off the bat. It was a deductive change order that subtracted about $21,000 from the total contract price. And that brought the contract price to $654,839 for both wastewater and stormwater improvements. While the project was under construction, we ran into some real problems with the soils. And we had multiple trench failures in both the stormwater lines and in the sewer lines. So before I get into the details of the money, how we're going to fund these cost overages, which are really based on additional quantities that were needed because of the trench failures, additional quantities of backfill, uh, traffic control, some delays. But I just want to show you, so you have a little more tangible picture what really caused this. So here's a site map of the project. The red line is the stormwater improvements. And so that begins here on Francis Street, runs down the alley. It's altogether about, about 700 lineal feet of storm line, and the pipe is about 10 feet deep. It varies a little bit. These are all gravity lines, so it's very important to hit rain as you're going through there. So down the alley first, then make a turn, and come down Ray Street. And then there are about 850 millennial feet of sewer main improvements. And the contractor began here on this corner, ran this way, all the way to uh, Washington Street, and then came back and did this last leg here. We had actually more problems on the sewer line because it's deeper. It's about 18 feet deep. And very significantly, there was groundwater in the bottom of that trench most of the time. So that just makes a trench failure situation worse. It makes the soil more unstable. So here are a couple pictures just to illustrate. I mean, we took pictures every day, so I have probably 200 pictures, but these are just a couple of illustrations. So you see the trench box here. That trench should be just maybe this much wider than the box. So they saw cut the pavement very neatly and then put the trench box in there to protect your workers while we are installing, in this case, a sewer line. It's a 12-inch sewer line right there. But you can see the soil just fell off here in a slab. It just poof, just came down. So it's mostly clay. Not much rock, no sand, and it's tight, but it didn't stand up. And then I would point out here, this is a little two inch water line. When the soil around that gave way, of course that broke. And then that has to be repaired also. We're looking at, you can see how the pavement here is undercut. So that has to be repaired. You have to cut that back and make that right. This is uh, on Georgiana Street right at the Washington Street intersection, this is Washington, going that way. Um, so you can just see that it creates a much wider trench than was anticipated in the contract. Quite a bit of extra work. You know, it takes more time 
than to deal with this. You're not going to do this work in the same amount of time that you would if the trench stood up and you were just able to move forward. Here's another example that really illustrates. You can see here, this just gave way. And in this case, the pavement went down too. So again, the trench box, and this is a little deeper. And you can see we've got a, a nice deep trench box. Here's a worker right here. You notice, here's where the original saw cut lines were. And you see that this is falling in against that trench box that whole distance. So the whole thing just went and moved the trench box <coughs> over. So you can imagine what that would be like to be down in that hole and feel that whole big steel cage move over with the force of that earth. So they're able to continue setting the pipe, but now they have to work this trench box free. That's caught there. And they have to do that in such a way that they don't damage the pipe. So all of this pipe has been tested pretty much in the last week of October. I'm happy to say it's all sound and all held water and drained correctly, so that's great. But it just took more materials and it took more time than we wished. One more picture. This is on Ray Street. This is a sewer trench. Now this is the reach where we've already gone down the street on this side with the stormwater. Here's where a little section of curb fell in, 40 to 50 feet of curb, we better, fell in the trench. So that had to be repaired. That's what you see here, fresh and bright over on the side. But that's right here, I'm sorry, I've got my cursor working. But what's going on here is to try to control those slabs just coming down, we just started benching the trenches just to keep it more reasonable. So now if it's going to slough, it's just going to be a shorter distance. We just tried to get a handle on it. But again, you can see we're about 16 feet wide here. So that's a lot wider than the original size of the trench that was contemplated. Another reason to take that extra care here is that there's an 8 inch uh, asbestos concrete water line right in here. And we really didn't want to break that. So we're just working very carefully around that. And then another thing we did is we went to CDF for our back fill. And that stands for Control Density Fill. It's essentially pea gravel with a weak mixture of concrete in it. So it flows and it doesn't have to be compacted with the vibratory concrete compactor. So that just minimizes trench builders there. So I think that probably gives a pretty good picture of what Brook and Brook was dealing with out there in the field. And that's the basis of these extra costs. So then we'll just go ahead and talk about the costs, I think. So there's a table here that lays it all out item by item. And on the stormwater side, we had extra excavation, extra paving, curb and gutter, and some extra traffic control for a total of $90,921.99. And of course, the question is, how can we cover these cost overages? They're not in the budget for this project. And the answer in this case is that we did some other stormwater projects this year, 2015, we finished them, and they're within the very same utility. So since we finished those projects under budget, that's fair game. We can move that over and apply it to these overages that are based on poor soils. So that was the 4th and H Street project and uh, Filterra units that we installed in the Peabody Creek Basin, so the Peabody Water Quality Improvement Project. So that's great. We feel good about that. Um, the wastewater side is a little more complicated. The total change order amount is $313,802.47. So we have seven projects that were wrapped up this year. And so we can fund $258,630 of that just by projects that we've finished. These are not projects that we're deferring or, you know, we're holding to our capital facilities plan. But we finished this work this year and we've got 
work complete, budget extra. So that's great. Um, we would have liked to have kept that money, of course, but there's no point in whining about that. Um, there, that does leave a balance, though, that we would have to come up with out of wastewater reserves. Money is available in wastewater reserves, and that's the 55173 So altogether, we do have a plan to cover these overages. Um, we brought this to the Utility Advisory Committee last week, and they did pass a favorable recommendation to City Council to go ahead and approve these change orders. So before we actually make that request, I think it's good to look at this handout. Um, and it shows really the financial history of the project. It lists the projects that we have finished and that we have some budget money available from. But then on the bottom half in the table, it shows the initial contribution from Olympic Medical Center, and then their supplemental contribution that they made, almost $70,000 when the bids were opened. And then you can see the credit for change order number one. And then you can just see how that all adds up. So that our new contract total for the two utilities together is a million fifty nine thousand one thirteen, but the city's total of that is seven hundred and sixteen thousand six twenty four. And so of this change order, the additional funding that we need to have from reserves on the wastewater side is fifty five thousand one hundred and seventy two dollars. So that's our request that city council would recommend that the city manager sign the change orders in the amount ninety thousand nine twenty one ninety nine for Georgiana Street Stormwater and three hundred and thirteen thousand eight oh two forty seven for the sewer improvements. Any questions? Questions? I have one question, Craig. How close to substantial completion are we? So we're about we're about ninety five percent. We have one more um, lateral to put in. That's been factored into these uh, these costs based on the depth we have to go and the length we have to go and the trouble that we had uh, going forward. Um, we factored in uh, higher costs than, than originally when we would have awarded this thing. So we can't, we shouldn't expect additional amendments to this, this contract and related to this problem. Then. I'm not going to say 100%, but we factored in the best of our ability the, the increased cost it's going to take to put, put this final lateral in. Okay. Other questions or comments? And one other thing, we do have $5,000 in minor, uh, one of the line items in there is $5,000 for minor change orders. That is part of the budget that we haven't, uh, still available, um, that was factored in. But we did look forward to, uh, Is there a contingency reserve involved with this project? No, we've gone through that. We have the five thousand dollars for minor changes. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Just five thousand dollars, right? Six hundred thousand dollar contract. Yeah. Well, yeah, there was I mean we 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 we've gone through the, the, the major contingency, but what we have left is that one line item for minor change at the five thousand dollars. Okay. So first of all I'd like to say I'm very relieved that uh, nobody was injured or hurt with all this so it appears safety practices must be uh, right where you need to be. So Thank you for that. Uh, out of the fifty-five thousand being funded from the reserves, how how much of the reserves is that? We uh, how big is that reserve fund? Mm. Approximately. To May I members of council, I can't give the exact number, but fifty-five thousand would represent somewhere around well less than five percent. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a comment. Okay. Um, I think we're lucky to be getting done at this time of the year, it seems to me, if these projects had gone on further, we have more problems. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, I attend the BOAC meeting, and um, so it was, uh, the whole committee concluded this was definitely a good idea. And I do appreciate that in the report, it says that we will be talking to um, OMC for the balance. One of the things that, um, that, that 
the problem with the, of the whole thing was that um, before any of the major changes, the city was paying about 47% of the overall cost, and, and OMHD was paying 52% of the cost. And so after this big change order, um, we are now at 67% of the cost versus OMHD being about 32% of the cost. So again, I do appreciate staff talking to them as, you know, the chances of them picking up part of this cost would be great, but obviously at least they should be well aware of what, um, how much more this thing went, and it wasn't something we expected to, so, so sharing the cost with that. Um, but thank you so much for this, and um, I would move to authorize the city manager to sign change orders in the amount not to exceed $9,921.99 with the Jordanian Street stormwater improvements DR0315 and not to exceed $313,802.47 for the Georgiana Street sewer improvement WW1415. The total contract price will uh, increase from $654,389.04 to a price not to exceed $1,059,113.50. Thank you. Second. We move to second. For discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, hearing any, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Oh, um, one thing I wanted to do for the public. I, although we share the same name with me and uh, with Brooke and Brooke, I am not related to them. So. Okay. If I can make one, one closing comment on this, the, uh, I always like to see a silver lining. Um, if you look at all those projects where we came under budget, the history of engineering and, uh, and the contracting is that we do bring those projects in under budget. This is one of the rare exceptions that it didn't happen. So there is a silver lining for engineering and contracting folks. Thank you, Jess. Customer, would you address, please? <coughs> Ms. Cass, pleasure. I move this friend. Second. 
Move a second. Any further discussion? Um, just one that number four, I was as I was reading through this thing, I realized this was one of those things that we're actually looking for in the future. We're planning ahead, and I think snaps very much for this. Motion okay. passes. Thank you. The resolution to amend the council rules of procedure. Mr. Mayor and Council, tonight before you, you have a memorandum that would uh, essentially amend the rules of procedure, adding a section to each of the council memorandums that are presented to council. It would include a summary section on funding for each item that has funding associated with it, as well as a funding overview. Uh, previously, the council procedures did not incorporate that funding requirement uh, to speak to financial impacts. Uh, the verbiage that's provided in the resolution for your adoption this evening uh, does correct that and incorporate financial impacts. Comments, questions? <coughs> um, thank you, Mr. West, and I, Mr. King's not here tonight, but I really appreciate this. This is work that, as a council member, I had to dig and study and try to find this information on my own which made my preparation for council much more laborious. Um, this is important. We are now looking at the overall financial picture, not just taking each project and hearing that this is important without understanding how it affects the taxpayers overall. So this additional information is very valuable. I appreciate this being brought to council. It's a great improvement. Thank you very much. I will I, I genuinely appreciate this and it's just to help not only us but those that refer to our proceedings and have been put to this and as, as well. It's just, but that's what's already been discussed. A lot of questions about how we get to the decisions we arrive at. This kind of memo, this kind of information is going to be more helpful in communication. Very appreciate it. And that would be to approve the resolution amending section 8 of the council rules of procedure. Second. Move to second. Any further discussion? Yes. Um, one is that in the funding section, I would like some changes uh, to be made. Um, I appreciate the fact that we're looking into the funding, um, but at the very end of the sentence, it says provide one or two sentences that identify how the project activity or contract that the council is being asked to approve will be funded. I'd like to add today and into the future so that both today, how we're paying for it, and how the maintenance of it, so that it's very clear in that memo. And the second thing I'd like to change is in the resolution, in that little paragraph, the sentence after the things that are underlined. I know I've talked about this before, and I don't know if council did. Uh, anyway, um, I really need more time for these packets, and it's ideally, I would like to say that this all written material for the agenda shall be delivered to the city manager by, the tw by 12 o'clock noon on the Thursday, the week before the city council meeting, instead of preceding. That gives us one week extra to actually get through these packets well, thoroughly, and completely. So that would be my suggestion to council that right now we get the packets on Thursday afternoon. We have to be ready for this meeting on Tuesday night. So that doesn't give us a lot of time, especially I work so, you know, my, uh, my time, except for the weekends when staff is not in place, is really limited. So I would urge the council that we give ourselves a week time to really discuss it. Some of the things, I don't think we have anything that's in front of us that could wait an extra two weeks. You know, things should be well planned ahead of time. So I would make that change and sitting proceeding, I would read it the week before. I don't think that's a dumb fair question. Of course, but is there a fact? Mr. Mayor and Council, is that plausible in your constraints here? Uh, I would say staff, staff would be concerned with moving the agenda deadline up once again. And I think it's important to keep in mind that most of the departments have lost significant staffing 
it's extremely difficult to meet the existing new deadline that we have. And I think that, that it certainly would present a challenge to move it up another day. What would concern me in addition to that uh, would simply be customer service and that most of the items we bring before council are there to serve the public, to serve uh, those that we work with in the community and it would take additional process time if we move that item up it would require the legal department to have all their documents done earlier and essentially it creates a bit of a chain reaction from a staff perspective so it, it truly is a challenge for staff um, but certainly we'd be interested in, in hearing what other council members have to say on that.
But in general, I would ask staff to look at the things that can be two weeks to give us the time for those things. Ms. Ms. Mayor, I actually suggest maybe abstaining from a few votes, maybe, and until we can get everyone on the same step, if they want your participation. Um, if a person has that saying, you do have the power of the mic. I will support you if you want to push something off for her. I absolutely will support you. Um, but if we don't get the votes, maybe we'll vote for the same for a while. Thank you. Okay. Let's see if you support for the uh, suggestion to the uh, deadline. The resolution of the City of Council of the City of Fort Angeles, Washington, amending section 8 of the Council of Rules of Procedure. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those. Um, would, I guess, a clarification, are we going to add the today and into the future for the modification to the memo or not? I'm sorry, I'm going to support it. Um, at, the, at the very, you know, the very first thing I spoke about was that at the very end of that first sentence, we add today and into the future, which means that funding is going to be looked at for the needs of today and also into the future. Okay. I'm going to work that. Yeah, I, uh, I made the motion. I could all right, so that might as well be Did you get that? Okay. No, that thank you. All right, where are we at? Lodging Tax Committee 2016 Budget Recommendations. Mr. Mayor and Council, before you, you do have the Lodging Tax Committee recommendations for the 2016 budget. Uh, there were uh, some increases proposed for 2016, including an increase to the Tourism Commission, the uh, Marketing Service Contract, <coughs> the Fine Arts Center, as well as the city priority setting cost recovery item. Uh, additionally, there was one decrease in funding, which was the visitor center contract, uh, looked at a decrease of approximately $3,900. I'd be more than happy to elaborate. I should uh, mention, just because there was a question asked of council earlier this evening, a uh, question relative to the Lincoln Theater. Uh, proposal. I will uh, note that the committee did not move forward with that proposal. Uh, rather, they deferred that proposal for uh, legal consideration and coordination with Clallam County, uh, being that a similar proposal was received by Clallam County. Okay. Be questions. happy to answer any other questions. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, perhaps uh, address to uh, City Attorney Lavar, if the Lincoln. Um, funding request is included in this, then I would like to cruise myself. I have no financial gain from this, but I have been intimately involved with the, the Lincoln Theater over the last year, and uh, I, I don't want to have any conflict of interest on that. So if, if we could be assured that... It's, it's not included it's, it's in it, because a, our requirements part. are to give funds to someone who already owns and operates a building, they don't own the building, we, are, we cannot at this time consider their request, so you're fine. Great. Other questions? I do have a couple questions. Um, the, tour, I noticed the Tourism Commission um, has asked for a raise, right, uh, from 23,500 to 26,000. Can you explain to us what we're going to get for that money? For the additional amount? Uh, there were some details provided in their application on that, and I know that the applications were distributed separately via email. Um, and uh, just, um, I, I don't have that particular application in front of me, I apologize. Um, but I will say um, that was an increase that was shared by other jurisdictions that also partnered with the City of Port Angeles in support of the Tourism Commission. Uh, they are doing some new and innovative things, including advertising. Uh, on mass transit in the Seattle area. Uh, some really interesting ads that they've done and some, a lot of creativity has gone into uh, what the Tourism Commission has put forward. Uh, the, uh, some of the other jurisdictions that participate in that would include Clallam County, Jefferson County, uh, Port Townsend, uh, City of Squim, and, uh, and, and quite a few others. But I will say those other jurisdictions are also providing an so this is um, because uh, there's that increase and also the increase for the marketing services, which has gone from 175000 to 200000 And I understand that this lodging tax money has to be used for the tourism or something that deals with uh, lodging tax. So it's got to be very specific. Otherwise, we have to go somewhere else um, or do something. Um, but again, I am, um, 
I need to see the my philosophical difference that I would prefer to use to have a smaller budget for marketing and use some of this money more for some of the physical infrastructure that will bring tourism in because at the end of the day, by the end of the year, we will have something physical that stays with the city that improves the city rather than just goes out in marketing and then, you know, we won't see that. So, um, um, anyway, so I would, um, appre I would not approve that raise on marketing. And I would rather see it go to either whether it's uh, recreational ball fields or anything like that. So that would be my recommendation not to have that increase in the marketing service. Mr. Chair, if I could address a couple items on that. Uh, I would note that certainly staff would very much also like to see additional funding go towards tourism-related capital projects uh, for city-owned infrastructure. I think that's important and that would bring some balance uh, to the lodging tax proposal. Um, and I think that's something that we can take, take a look at in the future. Uh, I would note um, that both of those uh, could happen, including the marketing increase. If you look at the fund uh, balance as of October, uh, it was in excess of $600,000 in the lodging tax fund. And that is a direct result of the increased revenue that we've seen over the last few years. We don't necessarily anticipate that revenue the increase will continue into the future. Uh, but we certainly think there, there are a lot of good uh, tourism-related activities that, that those dollars could be spent on. Um, additionally, I think it's uh, important to note uh, that relative to the $200,000 uh, marketing contract itself, uh, again, I did emphasize at the last meeting, and I think it's important to mention again this evening, uh, that we did issue an RFP. Um, and it did uh, have that as the uh, funding dollar amount included in that RFP. It's important to staff that we maintain the, art, the integrity of the RFP that was issued and honor that. And uh, for that reason, it's important we stick with that $200,000 figure. But I, I can tell you we will work with them uh, to try to get it a little bit below 200000 but I don't anticipate it, it will be much below 200000 So it was a staff $200,000 uh, I guess in the RFP, what we put that out? Staff worked with the Lodging Tax Committee to derive the exact dollar amount that would be utilized in the RFP. The $200,000 amount was the recommendation of the Lodging Tax Committee. I believe the council acted on that as well. Yeah, uh, yeah I'd like to follow up that. Council already has agreed to spend that two hundred thousand dollars. That money's gone. Um, can anyone report uh, Council Member Kidd as uh, Chairwoman of Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, or Mr. West? Can anyone report to Council of plans for the uh, kiosk or a manned uh, visitor center besides down, downtown? That is uh, under that will be under future discussions. This is our this is marketing, and so um, it's been it's expanded. It's brought it's brought more tourism. It's brought more money, more uh, more funds in, into our Fort Angeles is doing. This is this is a record year, so it's it's giving us a great ROI, return on investment. Um, I hear you loud and clear, and we will be discussing. That, that's the visitor center. This is marketing, and that's the visitor center. So we will be discussing that. Council Member Kidd, the, this is a lodging tax committee 2016 budget recommendation, okay. which marketing. includes much more than marketing. So, Mr. Yes. Mr. Mayor, if, if I may assist with that, two, two items that I would bring to Council's attention that we can do to follow up on that. Uh, one that we've already uh, uh, begin is discussions with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, one of the things that we will be incorporating in their contract is an option for the Chamber to consider additional locations in the future uh, that are different from their current downtown location. So we will be inserting that into their contract and that would uh, to some extent resolve Council's concerns uh, with the limited uh, current location. Uh, that some council members have brought up in prior discussions. The other suggestion that I would make is that perhaps staff introduce a lodging tax funded capital facilities 
plan item in the capital facilities plan <coughs> process uh, this year and uh, begin working essentially, I apologize, in 2016 and uh, we can begin work on a kiosk oriented uh, capital facilities plan item that is lodging tax funded for 2016. Well, my point is, is that two weeks ago we actually, I didn't vote in favor of it, but we spent 200 and what we're trying to do is give staff direction on spending an additional uh, 74,000 minus, or roughly half, again, what, what our total is. We're laying out a budget for staff to follow, Council Member Kidd, of a total of $520,000. That's what this is, discussion is about. Again, I don't see anything with, with an additional site uh, discussed or plans on spending the money. That's great to hear. It sounds like we have about $100,000 in additional funding that has yet not been directed. But with our actions tonight, we are going to direct staff to spend $520,000. On, on request that have come in and been approved, uh, from our it's, we've gone through the process this year. Our committee has probably sent, spent 20 hours of committee meetings to approve the request for funding for tourism-related events and marketing. And so we will, next year, we will be in talks with the chamber specifically about the visitor center and the locations. This is I'd also add on to that that uh, from being on the chamber board, they're very interested in looking at those alternative uh, potential locations. They've, they've started discussing that. They are in the process of losing the executive director at the end of December, and the search committee is up to beginning that process of the replacement. So I don't expect any news on this in the next few months, but they are discussing Well, we have, excuse me, we have a three-year contract with the chamber for operating the visitor center. Now, I certainly don't want a new place cited only being shopped with the Chamber of Commerce. I intend that to go out to the public as well to, again, get the best dollar for our uh, bank for our buck. So, <clears throat> again, this $520,000 has nothing that addresses my earlier concerns where I do not support spending $200,000 for marketing services. So I won't be able to support this one forward. Any additional comments? Um, yeah, because I, I, I guess my concern again, going back to the two hundred thousand dollars, it was something that I, I did not support. Um, and but I do understand that as council we passed it, so um, we're going to honor that. Um, the rest of the amount of money uh, seems, you know, fairly well split. Uh, I do know. I, I guess it looks like we're going to have extra money. And uh, yeah, Mr. West, I was just wondering that extra money that get raised from this year. Um, is there any way, you said you talked about putting a capital facility section in, in hopefully for this lodging tax. Is that something that um, we can ensure that the, I mean, what happens to the extra dollars? So I, I, I would want to correct that I, I don't believe we would say that we have extra dollars at this time. Uh, what we do have is a fund balance that essentially is reserves. Um, so presently, the budget that's before you is balanced, being that uh, expenditures and reserves align, or sorry, expenditures and revenues align at this time. So I, I don't think, I, I don't want anyone perceiving that there are extra funds, uh, but certainly we do have reserves that could be spent on one-time capital projects. And- uh, well, let, let me, maybe I can clarify. The, the lodging tax is, is, is what's considered a special revenue fund. And as such, state law restricts that those monies can only be used in furtherance of law, uh, tourism promotion. So any monies that are left over at the end of the year automatically roll into that, what's called the fund balance for that, for the lodging tax fund. Fund balance should be equated to a savings account. That they are one-time money, so once you take the money out, there is an automatic replenishment at some point during the year, unless there's monies, extra revenues over expenditure at the end of the year. But those monies can only be used for tourism-related activities. And there are 
some further technical restrictions as to how capital money is out of lodging tax, that the facility has to be owned by the, in our case, the city. I, 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 I just <clears throat> I think it would be very helpful to all of us to in as much as again the state of Washington, in as much as the state of Washington again did not fund marketing models for anyone in the state of Washington, let alone ourselves. That the marketing dollars we're talking about tonight are extremely just absolutely essential. We expect to tell our story about what a wonderful place this is to come to, uh, to recreate, to enjoy the, the things we take sometimes far too for granted. Uh, we need to we need to tell our story. We need to that cost money. I just want to reiterate that these these monies are extraordinarily important. The state won't do it. We better do it ourselves. And so uh, I, I have to I have to encourage us to to, to uh, provide them this opportunity. I'd like to actually address how the lodging tax advisory committee gets uh, recommendations. Do they poll the council, or do they poll the business community? How how are these ideas came up with? I fully support Councilmember Brooks' idea of, of, of having something to show for over half a million dollars. Last year was four hundred and some thousand. Sounds like it might be six hundred thousand actually by the by the time this year is over. Um, I do think that people come here for art. I do think people come here for other outdoor activities. Hell, I thought that we could use it for the football or the, the football stadium, the Civic Field, because I thought people come here to use the field at night. So I would actually push back on staff about what this can be used for, and you know, I welcome that discussion. But I again support Councilmember Brooks' idea. And, and I'd like to add um, two cents on this one: that we, um, out of all the so total is five hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So seventy thousand is for events, and I, I appreciate the events. That's the Crab Fest and all those wonderful festivals that we help, you know, fund. It brings people in, and we have fun, you know. Um, then we spend sixty-two thousand for the ball fields, and thirty thousand for the Fine Arts Center. Again, that benefits us, the locals. But besides that, the rest of it just kind of. You know, it's paper. And I would disagree that marketing is something, I mean, the state of Washington considered it the lowest priority, and so they got cut. We, if we build it, they will come. I don't think we need to shout it, you know, up the tops of the trees. I think people do come. People, you know, we got all that amazing uh, marketing for free for the best outdoor city. We didn't have to pay a cent for that. So again, I think if we build it, they will come, so I would prefer to see dollars get spent on Something that can stay here and it's not gone to two hundred thousand dollars for marketing service. But again, I know council has it, so we got it. Mr. Could respectfully I couldn't disagree more. I, I just <laughs> yeah, there's there are communities all over the United States buying for the tourist dollar and they're spending huge amounts of money. You see it on television for entire states and things of that nature. If we don't have a word out there in front of people, they don't know enough to choose us over choosing somebody else. And a consistent marketing plan is one of the reasons we have seen a consistent increase in the lodging tax dollars for the last 15 years. It has been breaking record after record after record. Now sometimes we could say, okay, well last year, or earlier this year, we had some extra from the, the oil rig and you know, there's going to be some general exceptions, but overall it's continuing to increase because we're telling our story. And I think to stop that, we might not see, we're, we're going to run on inertia for a year or so, but pretty soon everybody's going to go someplace else. Uh, 
I, I just, we cannot stop an aggressive marketing campaign, especially in light of just hiring this brand new top of the line marketing firm that should impress us. So can you imagine if we spent half a million every year making the city better? I think people will come. Well, there's a close up for this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's successful, it's working. The, frankly, the tourism commission is doing an amazing job. And now we're partnering with uh, Visit Seattle. That they're, they're trying to get people to stay longer by having a day trip to the peninsula. It's just expanding and it's successful. We need It's a tr tremendous return on investment for the businesses and the jobs and for Angeles. So we need to continue. To, uh, to fund our marketing program that's working for success. Okay, I think we beat this issue to death. I think we are very good on our decisions. There's a motion on the floor. All those in favor, both sat. Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Motion passes. Thank you. Council reports. That's not correct. Uh, none tonight. How about me first? All right, let's just pour your phone back. Go ahead, Brad. <laughs> Um, well, I'll be returning to Port Angeles on uh, uh, Friday night, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to get away and visit my family here in Michigan, and thank you. Okay, thank you. Good night. Right. Pretty sure you have more. Okay, well, I'll hang in there, but it's real slow. <laughs> no, no, I just didn't want to get any more report. Huh? You're getting okay. fake, Brad. All right, thank you. You can hang out, Matt. No more. No more. Um, I'll just report that uh, Council Member Gates and I represented the city at the uh, Veterans Day ceremony on the Coast Guard. It was well attended by a lot of people. I think there were over a thousand people there. But uh, it was, a, once again, a very uh, uh, exciting event for us to attend. And then we spent some time together at the Farmer's Market on the first Saturday. Month, and I don't recall any issues really coming up that uh, need to be reported on. It was more of people stopping by to say hi. So I think uh, I would encourage that I need the council in another month that should continue with that process of, of spending time with uh, the community down at the farmer's market. Yeah. Well, um, like uh, uh, Dan and Dan, I had an opportunity uh, to participate in the Remembrance Day uh, activities and events in Victoria. And uh, I simply want to say that I was truly very grateful and humbled to have the opportunity to participate in the behalf of the city of Port Angeles and the United States to have the opportunity to lay a wreath uh, and, and escort to uh, the War Memorial there in the bottom of the front of the building. It was a very solemn and impressive event. I just very appreciate the chance to be here. Um, I also would want to say, and I sat with Mayor Helps and others from the, and met with others from the Detroit City Council following the event, and they, Mayor Helps, apologized for not uh, getting together. She, you may recall that we talked about doing that this, this year and simply did not happen. And her calendar and her schedule is just it's very complicated. Having said that, uh, Mayor Helps and uh, Councilor, uh, uh, other Councilor members that wished and hoped to host us in the spring of 2016. So uh, we want to staff and, and also staff. Uh, have a day over there, uh, some kind of staff meeting with their staff, to meet with their staff, attend the city council meeting, probably uh, they will reschedule their meeting to be held on a Thursday at 5 p.m. And so, uh, just all together, a wonderful day. Okay. I just, uh, most, most folks have left, but, uh, I'd like to thank everyone that, that spoke about the Humane Society funding. Uh, I firmly believe that we need to honor our past agreement, and I'll do everything in my power to ensure that. Thank you.
in addition to the activities that the mayor mentioned, I've uh, also signed up to attend an executive seminar in Olympia. It's being uh, hosted by Governor Inslee, and the topic is preparing for the worst, the Cascadia fault line issue. Um, a lot of uh, executives, legislators, and elected officials are <coughs> discussing the uh, earthquake and tsunami threat posed by the Cascadia subduction zone. So I look forward to uh, bringing back information from that uh, endeavor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor and Council, I just want to follow up with clarification that staff will be bringing back to you uh, options relative to uh, full funding of the Humane Society contract, uh, documenting what other options there would be for Council to uh, cut relative to funding of that agreement. Uh, just to, to give you a ballpark figure that probably ranges between 20 and 25,000 to uh, replace the full extent of their funding. Um, but I just want to clarify that is the only item that Council has asked us to bring back relative to budget uh, for December 1st. That's what I recall, yes. So in addition to that, uh, Council, I do think it's uh, important to note that there is a very uh, short turnaround uh, prior to the next Council meeting. Um, the good news is, uh, Council Me Member Brooke, that we will have your packet to you a day early uh, due to the holidays. The uh, one thing that is a, <laughs> one thing that's important to mention, though, is I think it, it may be a difficult turnaround to actually provide you with those options uh, prior to the December 1st meeting, so we may be sending those options to you uh, approximately by uh, Monday, the 30th of November, uh, to provide for you to consider prior to the council meeting on December 1st. So I apologize for that, but it is a fairly quick turnaround prior to the next agenda. Um, and I believe that is all for the city manager's report. Okay, is there an executive session? No. Okay, we'll move into the public comment period. Okay, we're loud and clear. We now know what the county's dental contractor found when she examined the, uh, the eight and nine year old children for the 2005 Clown County Smile Survey. And let's see, they need those pictures, Edna. Huh? I've given you three exhibits, and it'll, it'll help me get through this and get, help you get through it if you have them in front of you. Exhibit one portrays children whose teeth had neither cavities or fillings. We sorted them out by the schools attended, which told us which children lived in an area where drinking water was fluoridated and which was not. The proportion of children free of cavities is shown as a percentage of all children examined in a particular area. Higher percentages means more kids free of cavities. Children living in fluoridated forests scored only 30.2% of so-called perfect teeth compared to 34.3% of those in Port Angeles, which at the time was without fluoridation, and 39% in non-fluoridated squim, obviously squim being the best off in much. Exhibit two, the next page. We then looked at numbers of cavities per child. On this graph, lower, lower bars mean fewer cavities per child. Again, we sorted them by exposure to water fluoridation. Forest kids averaged over one cavity per child, compared to less than one cavity per children in Port Angeles who swim. It is evident the children resident in fluoridated forests have more cavities than children living in areas lacking community water fluoridation. The differences between these groups are relatively small but the numbers of children that were examined are large enough so we can pronounce our conclusions are statistically significant at the 95% level of confidence. A third examination was made comparing all the children from each of the three areas who were not subsidized by the free lunch program. This circumstance is used as an indicator of low income. 
Our conclusion is unchanged using these more elite children. No help from fluoridation could be discovered. Exhibit three. This is a real kicker. It was a surprise. A memorandum from Clallam County Department of Health and Human Services in March 25, 2003, copied to Dr. Locke, in which Cindy Newman, RDH, and I think that's registered dental hygienist, states from the county's own smile survey that found children in forks for fluoridation has gone on for almost 50 years are more subject to dental decay than children in non-fluoridated Port Angeles and Squim, end of quote. Just why does admission the lack of effectiveness of our one low, lung fluoridated area was not a point of discussion before the initial adoption of fluoridation is unexplained. Lack of, of double blind trials to approve, I'm sorry, I jumped a sentence. Lack of proven benefit certainly needs further discussion at this time. FDA requires a successful double-blind trial to approve medication. In 70 years, this has never been accomplished for water fluoridation anyplace. With an increasing abundance of fluorides, blurring the differences between exposed and unexposed groups, it is not likely to be accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who speaks to council? Close public comment here. I want to thank everybody for it. I'd like to welcome here. I'm still here. The phone hasn't died yet. Okay, well, we're about to wrap it up. I'd like to thank everybody for coming this evening and hearing your comments, and especially to Corey. After seven years, 11 months, we finally have a clock on the wall that the council can do Thank you very much. Okay, there's no other business. We are adjourned. Thank you.